Hi, I'm Val Curtis, and welcome to another episode of Friday Harbor Live, where our brilliant and talented Islanders are sharing their skills and stories with island kids of all ages. And I have to say, I'm feeling pretty lucky because a lot we're seeing a lot more um, engagement. Man, Bob Gard's post brought out a lot of Islanders. So if you know anyone else who wants to share island history, we would love to have them on the show. And I'll put the link um, in the comments for that. So a quick PSA from the Family Resource Center. So many Islanders are feeling like st the stress and anxiety of the past few months is weighing really heavily on them. And given financial concerns, many people feel like they can't afford counseling right now. The good news is that we have some really great accessible resources on our island. If you have Washington Apple Healthcare, uh, behavioral health support is available at Compass Health. And that phone number is 360-378-2669 for more information. If you have health insurance with a big deductible that you can't dive into at this time, or if you have no health insurance at all, the Family Resource Center's Community Wellness Program um, may be able to provide you with easy and affordable access to counseling and behavioral health support. Their program can connect you with a wide range of local private practice therapists to choose from. And fees from counseling, um, or fees for the counseling are income-based. So it typically ranges from $5 to $25 per session. And here's a key thing that you need to know is that participation in the program is completely 100% confidential. So um, and there's my phone ringing, isn't that fun? It's live, kids. Um, so if you wanna find out about um, getting involved in that program through the Family Resource Center, give a call to find out more at 360-378-5246. And I am going to right now, as we speak, dun, 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 I'm going to put this copy in the comments for you so that you have access to those phone numbers. Definitely take care of your mental health during these times. It's we're in unprecedented times for us. I know other generations have gone through similar things, but hey, this is our first time in this dog and pony show, so to speak. So um, today, I want to say also thank you to the Family Resource Center and the San Juan Island Community Foundation for making this episode of Friday Harbor Live possible. And today, we have a very special guest. He has been a soccer dad. He's a dad who you see around the schools all the time. He's always there running around with his kids. And um, today we get a chance to talk to him on the professional side of things. Um, and, and we'll learn a little bit more about him. So enough with the curiousness of who is this man that we're talking about. Here he's going to come in three, two, one. Hi. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> and this is Thor Jensen, not Tor, <laughs> who we had last week. Yeah, good morning. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, Friday Harbor. Always happy to virtually see you all. Yes, and it seems this is the way that a lot of us are community communicating these days. Absolutely. So uh, I'm on here today to talk about news and reporting, which is how a lot of us are communicating with the outside world and understanding what's happening beyond the boundaries of our island and within the boundaries of our island. Uh, if you don't know, I've worked as a writer and reporter for over 20 years. I've written for dozens of newspapers and magazines, including Newsweek, Business Insider, The New York Observer, New York Mag Magazine, lots of others, too many to list. So it's been a vocation for a long time. It's something I take very seriously and something I think is really important. Uh, because our responsibility as journalists is to help you understand the world you live in and to give you the tools you need to make informed decisions about the world you live in and the life you lead. And I'm going to interrupt you really quickly. And in this age of information through a fire hose, as I like to call it, <laughs> where it's just mass quantities of information coming at you from every stream, we really desperately need this. And so I'm just going to hand it right over to you and let you take it away. Great. So yeah, our job, my job as a journalist and the jobs of you know the thousands and tens of thousands of other people who do this with me uh, is essentially to take that fire hose of information and 
turn it into something that is understandable and provable. And we get a lot of talk. You've probably heard people yelling about fake news a lot lately. That's been a popular phrase over the last couple of years. And our job is to ensure that what we are printing, what we are publishing, what we are showing to the world is as truthful as possible. And so it's important to note that being perfectly truthful, being perfect about anything isn't something that humans can do, but there are some sort of ground rules and structures and practices that we use as journalists that help us do our job and that you reading at home can think about and take to heart and help you learn more and understand more about what's going on in the world around you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of journalism and about the sort of varying outlets for journalism because you know there are many places you can get your news you can get your news from your local newspaper like your san juan island your journalist san juan's you can get it from a T seattle tv station you can get it from a national tv station you can get it from an exclusive news station and you can get it from thousands of different websites uh, each of which have their own approach towards reporting the news so i wanted to bring up a little chart here real quick if we could do that uh, hold on. Let me see if we can if we can share it. Let's uh, bring it up real quick. Hold on one second. Sorry for the delay. This is fairly new for me to do this. So I just brought up a tab. Huh. Val, can you bring up my screen share? There we go. We wanted to give it the whole screen so people can see it. Is that possible? I don't have control over this. Anyway, what oh, we're looking sorry. Um, I can you hear me right now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think if I get rid of you, that we may not be able to hear you, but let's give it a try. Okay, let's see what happens. Yes, it says audio only. I can still be heard. It Perfect. says audio. All right, this looks good. So what we're looking at here is a chart. Uh, developed by a nonprofit group called Ad Fontes Media that's called a media bias chart, essentially. And the way this was produced is that researchers for this organization read dozens and hundreds of articles from each of these sources and went through and categorized how much of that work is original reporting or facts that they, those reporters gathered on their own, how much of it is reporting that was gathered from other sources, how much of it is analysis, which is where a reporter takes facts and attempts to form them into a larger narrative or a larger story combined with other external factors, how much is opinion, which is essentially just the personal opinions and personal feelings of the writer, uh, what is presented, whether the information is presented fully and fairly, or whether things are left out that might give a different perspective on the story, and whether they're just purely inaccurate or misleading or just truly fake. So you can see here, it's a pretty interesting shape because it looks like a pyramid. And then the other axis on this graph is politically where these organizations stand, whether they're towards the left or towards the right or in the middle. And it's interesting to see when they shake out that the closer you get to factual reporting, the more neutral and in between you get. You'll see there's still a slight left-leaning skew, but it's very little comparatively. So what this tells us is essentially the closer you stick to the facts, the more neutral uh, politically your reporting will be. So you'll see like the AP Reuters up here, these are what are called wire services, which literally there is no space for opinion at all there. They take facts and they present them clearly and that's all they do and that's their business. And as we proceed down, we'll see major newspapers, New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, you know, a bunch of places I've worked for here. And as we go farther down, we kind of pull to each direction. We have newspapers like the New York Post, which is known to sort of lean slightly right. And we have networks like CNN, which is known to lean slightly left, MSNBC a little farther. So when we're consuming media, which we all do every day, whether we like it or not, one of the first questions to ask ourselves is where 
on this chart is our media diet coming from? And for most, you know, and it's really going to depend. And I'm sure that out there, you know, people who prefer one side or the other, one, you know, one source or the other. And that's, you know, it's fine and it's understandable. We na- we sort of naturally want to read things that uh, agree with us. We want to feel like we're, you know, in good company with where we get our news. But a thing to note about this chart is that even though these up at the top are reliable and factual, they're still not always correct or not always trustworthy or not always unbiased. This is an aggregate, it's an average, and there's going to be bad actors up there. There's going to be, you know, less responsible journalists up there. There's just fewer of them. And by the same count, these things down here, these sort of misleading or incomplete or selective, you know, you see Fox News all the way down here. Is this saying that everything on Fox News is misleading or incomplete or selective? No. You can't write them off entirely, but you should be aware that that's the case. So this is sort of a picture of what the media looks like in the United States right now. These are the major places that people get their media. And we can close that stream share and bring me back in. So that said, now that we have a sort of picture of what we're doing, the journalists at virtually all of these places are going to go through the same procedure when they write a story. They're going to have an idea for a story, they're going to report out the story, and then they're going to publish, they're going to fact check and publish the story. So let's go through those steps as to how an average reporter would put a story together for the world. I'm going to drink a little beet juice first for energy. So when we're working, when we start our day as a reporter, we need to have an idea for a story. And typically that's not going to come from the reporter ourselves. It has to come from some outside source because we're not usually walking down the street and see something newsworthy happening that we can then immediately write about. So those those story ideas come from a variety of sources. They can come from other media, which is in the national media. When I work for Newsweek, for example, a lot of my stories would start with reportage in small town newspapers and like different newspapers around the country, because this is stuff that is not, and since Newsweek is like a national or a global publication, this is material that people on the national level are not seeing yet. So it's my job to take it and find things that are relevant and interesting to a national audience from these local audiences. So that's one place we find stories is other reporting. I do a lot of science reporting. So I read a lot of scientific journals and medical journals to see new studies or discoveries or events in those worlds that can be brought to a national audience. So the instinct of a reporter comes in here, whether we see, is this interesting? Would this be valuable to somebody to learn about, you know, or to know more about? And then other information like that comes from tips, comes from people reaching out to us for various reasons. And I think that one thing we're seeing a lot uh, in the modern world right now is that there's a lot of tips coming from inside government. People are writing a lot about you know our current political situation uh, from various places in there. And these tips can come from people who want to be acknowledged. They can come from people who want to remain anonymous. They can come from all walks of life, all sources. There is no such thing as a bad tip. But it's important to recognize that the people who are telling you things, the people who are giving you information, can be doing it for reasons that are different from your reasons to report it. So for a reporter, it's really vital to keep that in mind as well. Like, why is this person telling me this? Why do they want this reported? And, you know, what are the consequences of my reporting this? We never want to not report something that's true for, you know, reasons that would, you know, protect somebody or for, you know, that would not, we don't, we don't want to go along with somebody's plans just to report something that's true. Essentially, we want to make sure that our rationale for publishing is always within the public interest. So, and then, you know, we find information on social media is very big for reporters. Now people are always looking at places like that. And we're also talking to businesses and government agencies all the time. We're talking to police departments. We're talking to, you know, uh, court officials. We're talking to politicians a lot. So we have all this information, these big clouds of information, and we go through and we pick out things that could be interesting to our readership, uh, things that 
connect to things that are happening in the world today. Like it's a great example of, you know, local events uh, can ripple up to national events. A good example of that is when the COVID-19 pandemic first began uh, and there was a Washington nursing home that was struck very hard and we were very early on that. That was an example of local reporting that would become very relevant to a national audience as the story progressed. So we evaluate our content and then we begin to report, which is we begin to do the due diligence of making sure that what we're going to publish is factual, is not biased, and can be backed up, you know, in the face of a challenge. So let's go through the stuff there first. And if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'd love to talk to, you know, answer more of them, talk about what we're doing. But our first responsibility as reporters, as news reporters, as writers, is to make sure that what we are writing is factual to the best of our abilities. And there's a many ways that we do that. First and foremost, as a reporter, unless you were on the scene of an event as it happened, you cannot state for a fact that something happened. You can cite people who were there. You can talk, you can examine video footage or photographs or other things, but we cannot say this happened unless we have firsthand evidence that this happened. That's why you'll see a lot in write-ups of events, you'll say video footage showed or a person on the scene said, because that is our sort of bulwark against uh, being dishonest or being false or being fake. We have to say, every fact that we bring to the table, unless this is like a well-known historical fact or something that is scientifically proven, you know, like the chemical composition of water, for example, something like that, something that is known as a fact, anything outside of that, we need to have a source to prove it and state it to us. So when we're reporting, a big part of reporting is making sure that we are reaching out to sources with as many perspectives as possible. So if you were writing about a dispute at a business, you would reach both out to the business for their perspective and the person complaining about the business for their perspective, and you would present them both. So a key thing to look at when you're evaluating something you're reading for yourself is does this reach out to both sides? Does this talk to and get comment from everybody involved? in this in the situation and you'll note that like if you look at places high up on that chart they will have that comment or they will say that they made a request for that comment even if that comment wasn't provided so a key tenet i think when you're evaluating that news is are the the involved perspectives presented so we see a lot of that in our reporting on politics right now in that there is a lot of uh, reporting on the president and the things he says and sort of the response to the things he says. And even when things are said by the president that we sort of contradict what we consider to be factual, we still present his statements. We say the president said this, and then we reach to the other side and say, this person with this background, you know, this experience, or this historical event contradicts that. We are required, you know, as diligent journalists to do both. And if somebody is not doing both, then they're not doing their job. So we report out. We get as much information as possible, as much information that we can check. It is highly likely that when we go to print, we do not have complete information because things are always moving, things are always changing. But before we publish, we want to make sure that what we publish is a coherent timeline. So when somebody's reading it, they can say, oh, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. I understand the sequence of events as they happened. We have input from people who are involved and we sort of close it up as this was the situation. That's our job. It's to present reality as clearly and fairly as possible. 
So, and then this goes to an editor or a fact checker or both, depending on the organization that you work for. Some uh, places that I've worked have very sort of uh, low impact editorial processes where an editor will go through and just make sure that, you know, your phrasing is accurate and that you're citing all your sources. And then some places such as the New Yorker or the magazine have incredibly robust fact checking departments where they will look at your piece and they will call every single person that you quoted and ask them, did you say this to this reporter? And they will painstakingly you know, verify everything you say. So another thing to think about when you're consuming media, reading media is how vigorous is their fact checking process? How much sort of extra work goes into the reporter's work? Because the more that goes in, the more likely that what you're reading is verifiable and true. And then we publish. And then a lot of stuff can happen after we publish. Things can change dramatically. Things when new information can come to light and you know, what was written in a story, what was told to us, because as reporters, although we try to take what people tell us as truth, the fact is that people don't always tell the truth. People will lie to reporters constantly and consistently. And if we can't verify that, we have to present what they said. And then if something that we printed turns out to be untrue, the second responsibility of a reporter is to go in and issue a correction to say, we printed this, it was not correct this is, you know, to our knowledge, the correct sequence of events. And there's a third thing for you to look for in a publication is do they regularly publish corrections when they get things wrong? And on that chart, you'll see, you know, if you look at any of the top things on that chart, they'll have whole sections of corrections because reporters are human, you know, and we're doing the best we can with limited information, check the corrections and make sure. And, you know, down towards the bottom, you'll see very little of that, very little of sort of recognition that a mistake was made. So those are the sort of the key, that's the key cycle of the job. We find an idea, we report the idea out, and then we publish and continue monitoring afterwards to make sure that the information we're presenting is still vital and valuable. So and I was going to ask you a question, though. I've been totally enjoying this. Um, one of the things, like the entire electronic medium of news, has it seems to have just decimated journalistic integrity <laughs> um, altogether because anybody can put information out there and call it true. And, um, and social media on top of that <laughs> and kind of spreading information. And I know some social media channels are really working to um, kind of reel it in a little bit. Um, I know during the previous election, there was a news piece that went out about Hillary Clinton, but I looked at it and I was like, you know what, there are so many typographical errors in this, this can't be legit. And so literally it took me going to find the source of the article within that article and then one more click and it was from a Russian site. Yeah. I mean, I was able within two clicks to go, oh my gosh, this thing that just got thousands and thousands of shares is totally, I mean, that was in April, you know, yeah, before absolutely. the election. And so it is so important during this time when information is just flying so quickly to really look to credible sources, which you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been very challenging as a journalist because the perception of journalism is being pushed so far outside of our boundaries, essentially, by this flow of fake information that people see fake things. It looks like a legitimate site. It looks reputable, you know, and so they that distrust that is brought from being fooled and being suckered by stuff like this, it reflects on the whole profession. It's very difficult and there's nothing we can do. The only thing we can do as journalists is to do our best, you know, with you know, with our own reportage and to develop, you know, a reputation on our own and for our institutions as places that will do the job honestly. So that's actually, that brought up, if you want to go to this shared screen I have up, this is yeah, something I'll jump that out. happened with my kids, I think, if you want to bring that to the full screen. Uh, going viral uh, last month, and it was... 
this is something that was going viral last month. It was all over. I saw lots of kids sharing this on Instagram. And it's a really great example of both what to look for and how easy it is to get fooled. So after the death of George Floyd, the man in Minneapolis that uh, you know was sort of the inflection point for the protests, the Black Lives Matter movement that we've seen this year, there was a lot of news going around, a lot of falsehoods going around. And something that was I saw shared on Instagram hundreds of times by people, you know, kids I know, people I know, was this image purporting to be from The Simpsons, you know, several in nineteen in the nineteen nineties that predicted, you know, the death of George Floyd uh, uh, in when the police officer involved situation with Lisa Simpson in the background holding a Justice for George sign. So this is something that is sort of made for people to be like, oh, to be like shocked by and to be like sort of enthralled by. It's a fascinating thing. Oh my gosh, this TV cartoon, how is this possible? It's something that is, you know, it's designed to get attention, which is what a lot of these unreliable sources traffic in. They want attention. They don't want like to build a reputation as being trustworthy. They want attention for something right now. And so if you look at this image, there's a lot of things about this image that are, you know, troubling from a factual perspective. Like it doesn't look very well composed. The police chief's foot is missing from his leg. There's a lot of things that don't look real. Like the George on the sign is in a different handwriting. There's a lot of things about this that on closer examination look suspicious, but people don't consume on these social media services like Instagram and your Instagram stories for close examination. They're designed to be fast. They're you know looked at quickly and then they go away. They disappear. So I showed this to my kids and my kids are pretty I like to think my kids are pretty smart. They're pretty clever about the world and they both fell for it instantly. They both like, oh this is the Simpsons. Oh my gosh, how is this possible? So I had to have a talk with them. And I think that it's important to have a talk with people in your life about stuff like this. Like, can you look at this? Look at the website. This is on jordanthrilla.com. I have no idea what that is. I've never heard of this site. I don't know who runs it. I've never seen them cited or referenced. If you Google this story, you'll only find references to this page on jordanthrilla.com. There's no other reporting. There's no other sources. You know, if there's no reaching out to Simpsons producers. There's no reference to what specific episode this was in. You can watch every episode of The Simpsons on Disney+. Plus. You could easily, if this existed, reference it and find it. So you'll see that this spread because they created something that was false but interesting, and then they did not provide any information that could disprove this. So I'm going to close this share and go back in. So this is sort of something that is a good test case for learning how to evaluate media and learning how to talk about what you're looking at and what people are sharing. Because I'm sure if you're on social media, you're having people share stuff to your timeline all the time that is not falling within the structures of what we would call good or responsible journalism. So for me, at least, like understanding what questions to ask about what you're reading understanding who published this, where are they located, who, you know, who funds them if they're not funded by advertising, you know, do they have a bias that is noticeable? Are they leaving out information that could prove or disprove something they're writing? Have they talked to everybody on both sides of the situation? If you can't get satisfying answers to those questions, then you should consider doing more research on this news story that you're reading, especially before sharing it. So there's some interesting things. And we talked about social platforms and uh, how they encourage this kind of thing. They encourage this kind of sort of fast reacting, fast sharing, you know, not looking too deeply, not spreading. And so some platforms have done some interesting things like that. Uh, Twitter, for example, if you try to share a news story on Twitter that you haven't clicked through to actually read, if you're just sharing it on the headline, it will now pop up a message saying, are you sure you want to share this without reading it? So I think that there are these sort of working with these platforms from a journalistic perspective is difficult because they have their own agendas. They have their own things that they want, but it's nice to see them sort of recognizing their role in 
disseminating this information and spreading this stuff that is not valuable. So, you know, if I were to sum up, don't believe everything you read, but reputable journalism will give you the facts and the tools you need to make an informed decision. And if a, if a piece is not giving you the facts you need to make an informed decision, you might have to work a little harder. And for that, we're sorry, but we're doing our best. I love that. And I have to ask you too, because since you've been in this business for so long, um, in seeing the shift for immediacy of information definitely um, corrodes the ability to check multiple perspectives. And I know from my tiny little bit that I was in the electronic media space, the chasing of headlines is it's rapid fire. I mean, it's, it goes so quickly, like one topic comes up and then there's 40 articles out there where with news, we used to be on a 24 hour timeline, right? You used to be like, you know, this, this is hit, go get your information, run, go. And you know, you'd have people after it, but it seems like now it's the immediacy of everything really corrodes the integrity of the information that can even be gathered. Right. The cycle is much faster. And uh, in a lot of places, a responsible journalist can adapt to that fast cycle. They can say, here's what we know now, here's what we've proven. And one of the advantages of the internet of digital media is that we can continue to update and add to stories. And I think that that is sort of a healthier direction for journalism to go to is we are learning about the situation, we are monitoring it. Here is what so far we can publish as proven or stated, you know, and please come back. And so, and then we'll use our social channels. We'll use our other mechanism to say, this story has been updated. There's more information you need to know. But it's true, like there's a very strong incentive to be first past the post with a story now. It's very, especially something that, you know, is trending globally or is trending nationally, something that people are actively hunting down. Uh, financially, it is, you know, it's important for a news organization to do that. And so it's, that's a struggle that individual reporters can't do anything about. Like we notoriously have very little control over the financial decisions of our publishers. They're going to do what they're going to do. And we're going to disagree with decisions they make. Like I can't think of a publication I've worked for where I didn't disagree with at least one, you know, uh, you know, programming choice or publishing choice they made. So for us, the, it really, the buck stops with us. The buck stops with an individual journalist. And I really encourage if you find people who are writing in ways that you feel comfortable with, that you feel like they're presenting information for you, that you feel like that this is somebody that is trustworthy and is doing good work, that follow that person, you know, follow mm -hmm. them on social media. They may have a public profile to follow, you know, getting that relationship with somebody is going to be valuable because if they're a journalist who cares about that relationship, if there's somebody who is cares about the ethics of their profession and the quality of their work, then their work is going to remain valuable no matter where they go or who they publish for. So just, you know, be aware of these things, be aware that these are people, you know, and they are coming to it with different levels of integrity. But yeah, no, I like that. And I mean, I know Twitter is a great space to follow reporters on. And um, they're they're all on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, we are. Every I do not know a single news reporter who does not use Twitter. It is an incredibly vital tool. Yeah, and it's um you get so much more backstory. I think um following different reporters on Twitter. But I really like that point um because it's. A couple of things that you brought up that I really want to reiterate that I think are really um, are making me think about how I'm looking at information is one when you have a source that you like to go to for information, you know, check that they're updating their stories because that right there tells you about the legitimacy of the source. If they're jumping back into their stories and saying, hey, here's updated, edited to add. Right. If you start seeing those things in their news feed um, and in stories that you come back to. That's good. Um, the second thing is to follow reporters um, and to kind of see what they're sharing in different spaces and, and follow um, if you like their style and you see that they're coming back to add that that um, you feel like they're doing a, a legitimate job in gathering information to, to follow individuals as well as, as sites. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's an opportunity that is very new to the digital space. Like previously, if you wanted that interaction with a reporter, you'd buy the newspaper they worked for, the magazine they worked for. And so to have that kind of closer connection for an alternate feed, because oftentimes reporters will post things on their socials that is not necessarily stuff that's going to go into an article. It's stuff that is around, it's ancillary or other interviews or other sources or other perspectives. So it's always, it's a valuable tool. And I think that it's something that, you know, everybody can do. Yeah. And also when you're going to um, an individual source, sorry, I just had something pop up. Um, when you're going to an individual source, um, like um, let's say you have a particular newspaper that you like to follow for information and you follow along with them. Just if people can just take that pause when they see something in social media and it catches their eye and it's a hook, right? I mean, that's what this is all about. It's about a hook. And, and I mean, I know from my time in this business of like, you want a hook and you want to register an emotion, right? right. And so if you're reading something and you find that you're reacting to it, just like make that a huge stop sign. Yeah. That, that should be your signal to take a minute and look at for another source, look for another perspective. Absolutely. And you'll see that a lot, especially we looked at that pyramid of sources and you'll see a lot towards the bottom. One of the most common phrases they use to get that reaction is no one is reporting this. Like if you see that in a story, no one is reporting this. That's a red flag right there because that means they don't want you to, to check that story. They want you to get that emotion and leave it, you know, and get carried by it. So yeah, absolutely. Well, and I have to say, and it's kind of strange being in social media because you are in a bit of a bubble um, because it's your people who you're following for the most part, except for that sponsored stuff that comes in. But, you know, it's interesting because I have to say over the course of the last year, I have seen so many more people say, what's your source on this? Mm -hmm. To actually question things that people are putting up and do that. <laughs> You know, just be like, hey, just curious if you actually tapped into this article and read it. I mean, don't be sarcastic. Of course, you're going to lose all your friends. But, um, <laughs> but you know, to say, what's the source from this? Is this legitimate? I mean, there was a picture that was put up um, along the same lines of murder hornets. Mm. It was the, the picture was like the person's hand was like this. And the murder hornets, I'm going to use this pen, were easily... Like, whoa, that's really hard to do on the camera. We're easily overlapping the sides of the person's hand. And I was like, okay, this is not a child's hand, right? This is not a child's hand. So the first thing that I did, because of course it immediately like, <gasps> like, oh my God, right. that here yeah. crazy, you know? So, you know, that part. And I went, whoa, okay. So I went and looked up those, I don't even call them murder hornets. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but um, I went and looked them up, and the largest part of their species is the adult female, which is two inches, right? Which is yeah. still big. Mind yeah, you. but like, it's I not. Do not want to mess with the two inch hornet. However, it is not going to hang over the sides of my hand. Right. And that's, you know. You know Exaggeration is very popular. It's a very popular rhetorical device. And it's, you know, a good way to build that emotional, that sort of intense emotional impact that certain, you know, people are looking for. So that's a good thing to think about is like, why am I having this intense emotional reaction? What about this is, you know, getting to me? Because honestly, as a reporter, you should be eliciting a reaction. You should make somebody care about what you're writing about, but you should make somebody care about the facts of what you're writing about, not the spin you put on it or the twist you put on it. And that's a challenge. Yeah, and we definitely, I think, particularly in probably the last five to six years, I mean, what's getting so overutilized is fear and alarm. I mean, those two are just like the biggest hooks. And I mean, it's been used in news forever, right? It's like right before the commercial break, you know, it's the, it, it's the like train wreck coming up next, <laughs> you know, and it's like, so people come back after the commercial break. But, um, so that tool has been utilized forever, but now what's happening is we're getting so bombarded with it. Um, 
And we were, I was actually having a conversation with a writer uh, last week and we were talking about kind of the strange psychological torture that social media can be because in one second you're looking at your friend's brand new baby, right? And your heart's like all filled with warmth and joy. And then the next second it's, you know, some inflammatory false headline. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely there's a lot of whiplash that you can get absolutely from the sort. I mean, and one thing that's important to recognize is that human beings today are absorbing and being presented with more information than ever before in human history. And so a lot of the science writing I do is about brain science. It's about how our brains and our consciousnesses are adapting to this situation. So it's important to recognize that, like you might not be very good at taking in all this information. Yeah, I you know, as a person, you might need to slow your pace of consumption. You might need to take a little longer. And it's hard in an environment that's incentivized to do the opposite. But it's not a problem with you. It's not something that is wrong with you. It's not something that is wrong with any of these people who are having problems separating what is fake from what is real or what is trustworthy mm -hmm. from what is not. This is a new challenge for humanity. Yeah. And you know, as a journalist, part of my job is to help people surmount this challenge or to help people find a healthy response to this challenge where they can live in this information environment that is so different and so overwhelming and so complex. And I think that if I can do one thing, you know, in my work, that is valuable. Yeah. And so what are some ways that you might suggest, I'm kind of throwing this off the <laughs> cuff to you, but um, what are some ways that you would suggest for people to kind of gather their digital news sources? Yeah, sure. So the first thing I would suggest is read every article to the end before you share it. Read everything before you share it. It's so easy and it's so frictionless to share things and spread things, but really read it, understand your feelings about it and your perspectives towards it. And you know what? If you have a political bias or a cultural bias and you're sharing things that reinforce that bias, that's not a problem per se, because we are human beings and we have opinions, we have thoughts, e journalists too. We try to keep them as out of our work as much as possible, but it's important to understand that that's a bias. It's okay to have a bias and embrace the bias and be honest about the bias. And that's fine. So yeah, read everything to the end, seek out primary sources, seek out articles that have interviews with the people directly involved or affected in what you're reading. So if that's present, that's great. If it's not, look for it, find it, find that primary source that can be, you know, an interview, can be a social media post, it can be, you know, all sorts of things. There's always going to be a primary source for reputable news. No source, no news. And these sources can be, you know, we've seen a lot of anonymous sourcing recently, which is something a lot of people struggle with. But an important thing to recognize is that a reputable publisher will not publish anything based on a single anonymous source. They will always require multiple independent people, even if they all wish to remain anonymous. And there are lots of really good reasons that people do that. So, you know, if it's anonymous source, there should be multiple sources. If there's primary sources, you should be able to see and read and understand those primary sources. So find those sources, understand where something is being sourced from. And just finally, like, try to expand your spread. Try to expand the different outlets that you read in. It's okay to have a favorite paper, favorite journalist, favorite writer, but, you know, look to other sources. And that's a great thing about my work as a journalist is I get to read papers from all over the country. And there's so many incredible regional and local journalists working you know, in like for the Cleveland Plain Dealer is an incredible paper that publishes great stuff. Like uh, Austin City Paper publishes tons of really good stuff. Miami New Times publishes tons of great journalism. I don't live in those cities, but they're doing great work. Cool. And so I think that having that spread will make you more informed and a better consumer of news. That's great. No, I really appreciate that. And there's, if we mentioned kind of that, um, a first checkpoint for people is that if it has an emotional trigger, like check yourself first. I like reading to the end before you share. Absolutely, that's great. But is there something that you would kind of um, use as a stop point for people? If they jump into an article and they see X, 
Mm. So I wouldn't honestly, because even the most like <clears throat> dishonest person can still, you know, they say even a blind squirrel can find a nut every once in a while. So there's, <laughs> there's even the worst, the worst, most garbage, you know, outlet out there is still capable of publishing something that is truthful and something that is real. So you cannot discount anything, okay. but going in, you should have these ground rules. If actually, can, can this be backed up? You know, what is the motivation of the person writing this? You know, find those questions and apply those questions to everything you read from something in the New York Times to something at the Gateway Pundit. You know, apply those same questions to everything you read and you will sort of see the pattern of the answers you're getting should be fairly stable across front in one publication and should be fairly different you know from publication to publication so asking those questions is the most valuable thing you can do well and also i would add on to that it made me think when you when you mentioned that to to think to understand what the source is that you're looking at because i have to tell you that it was i want to say it was it was at the beginning of all of this with COVID that a friend put up a post and she was her comment about it was that it was right is rain but it was from the onion uh, and I, yeah. <laughs> right. Which for those of you who don't know is a completely satire, like comedic, <laughs> you know, reprieve kind of site. It there, it's not where you go for your fact checking. So, <laughs> so it's also to understand kind of where, yeah. what are the other, what is the other content on this site look about? And I kind of sent her a gentle private message. <laughs> And sometimes you have to. And I mean, people, and so that's a good example is every site that presents news should have a masthead on it. You should be able to click an about page that says, this is our publisher. You know, this is our editor in chief. This is who you contact for corrections. You know, if, a, if it is a reputable news outlet, those are things that will be part of its ordinary mode of operations. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, Thor, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for- well, thank Thanks for having me. It was a good time. Yeah, thanks for doing that. And, you know, with everything moving as it is right now, good luck to you. All right, thanks. <laughs> and be well to your whole family. And yours as well. Have a good one. Take care. And to everyone else watching, thank you so much for joining us here today. What a great conversation to have with Thor during this time and really appreciate him giving his time to do it. For all of you, I always say it, keep listening, keep learning. And obviously we're gonna add into that read as well. So know where you're clicking, know where you're sharing from, and we will see you tomorrow with Miss Melina for our Littlest Islanders. Thanks so much, bye-bye.